Um, and I might not have time for questions, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, but feel free to like come up to me if you want to ask me a question or want to tell me my session sucks or something like that. No problem. Um, so don't see anyone coming in. So I'm just going to go ahead and start and uh, try not to like blitz you guys with my last talk. So good afternoon. Thanks for coming to say hello there to Camera 2 API. My name is Wayne Dow. I am an Android developer, have been for about five years, and I have actually done quite a bit of work with Camera 1 API. And you know, last year when a Lollipop was announced, I got really excited because they announced this whole new Camera 2 API, right? And they promised it'd be bigger and better and faster and stronger. And you know, I, I actually spoke about Camera last year at DroidCon. And I had this whole bit where I talked about the future of camera, and I had kind of watched videos and looked up what the new camera 2 sounded like, and I was really excited. And, and I had this whole bit where I go, you know, camera's going to be so great, the future's going to be amazing. And, you know, I actually sat down with camera 2 when it came out, and I, I started trying to get into it. And I found that, well, the camera 2 API is amazing, dealing with it was a lot like this. And eventually, a lot like this. So the problem was is that between camera one and camera two, there is like a, just a drastic shift in the entire system. You know, I sat down and you know, camera one is actually pretty straightforward to use and get started. And I actually would encourage people to do custom camera applications for whatever reason. You know, if you wanted to do something cool with the branding of your you know application or whatever, I would encourage people, yeah, just go ahead, do a custom camera application. It's really, really you know, easy. And then I sat down at camera two, and it's like my tiny little brain just couldn't wrap around this new API. And you know, it, it wasn't until I read the documentation. I, I didn't I don't just mean like the camera two API documentation. I read up on the graphics architecture and I read up on kind of like the camera subsystem, which is all these kind of middleware layers that live between the Java framework and the actual camera device drivers. And that's when it started clicking and that's kind of when I understood kind of like the foundation of this crazy new thing called camera two. So instead of like going through code with you guys, which would take a long time and, and probably just wouldn't be help, helpful to you, I kind of just wanted to share, I guess, the foundations of the switch from camera one to camera two and to kind of help you understand what's going on under the hood because I, I personally feel like that's what helped me the most to understand like the ins and outs and why this new API is kind of set up the way it is. So um, today I want to talk to you about you know camera one versus camera two. And um, quick show of hands, who's done anything with camera one? Awesome, cool. So we'll talk about camera one compared to camera two, and we'll talk about this kind of foundational change, like this, this kind of these middleware between you and the camera, the camera subsystem, and how that informs this whole brand new API. And we're gonna kind of talk very at a high level about how you get started uh, building camera application, the steps to capturing an image with camera two, and then I'll talk to you about some caveats with using the camera. So at the very, at kind of like at a very kind of basic level, you can kind of think of camera one versus camera two as like the difference between a point and shoot camera and a DSLR. You know, a point and shoot camera is pretty simple, but it's really easy just to pick it up and get started. It might have like limited features. It might not take the best pictures. It might not be that performant, but it's really easy to get started, you know? And you can kind of, you don't have to be an expert at photography to use a point and shoot camera. Now, a DSLR is a whole different animal, right? It's definitely much more of an advanced level uh, tool. There's more controls, there's more features, so you kind of can do more with it, but you kind of have to know what you're doing, right? And the language you use when you talk about a DSLR camera is different, right? You're talking about aperture and ISO and peaking level and all that kind of junk. And you know, so the learning curve is steeper. And there is just a lot more room for you to mess up. And that's pretty much exactly what it's like going from camera one to camera two. So kind of like the relative complexity of these APIs are a reflection of kind of the those middle layers, that subsystem I talked about, you know, all that stuff that you would never have to touch that lives between you and the camera itself. So camera one subsystem is basically a black box, or I, I've also heard it described as a one-way stream. Basically, you create the request, you maybe ask the camera to toggle some settings, you know, give me sepia tone and you know autofocus and all that stuff. You send the request in, and hopefully at some point later, you get back some image data and some metadata. And that's pretty much it. Now, this black box. And you think of it as like a black box with those big iron lever levers, right? And it's got like three positions, okay? The first position is still, you know, capturing a single image. And then the second position, second mode, is video where you're just, you know, kind of 
requesting a continuous stream of images. And preview, which is basically a video, but kind of at a lower resolution, you know, that, that people use as a viewfinder. Now, you picture this black box with this big metal lever in it, and as you can see, there's probably not a lot you can do with it. And one of the things that I think got a lot of attention, at least from what I read when I read about camera two, was this idea that we could now have burst mode with camera two that you couldn't have with camera one. Now, burst mode is this idea that you want to take X number of pictures as soon as possible. And if you kind of think about the three modes that you had in camera one, still video and preview, there's not really an efficient way to kind of translate, you know, burst mode into one of those three previous modes. And so, and that's kind of like the point, right? The camera one with a black box is basically not extensible in any kind of um, meaningful way. And just another thing is that, you know, even if you had a sexy camera with like manual exposure and manual this and manual that, you can access it, right? There's no way to change or handle what's going on in that black box. So in my opinion, I think the camera two was really a direct response to these limitations. And you know, it, it's not just like an update to the API, it is an entire rework. It's an, actually like an entirely different API. And like I said before, you know, the API is, a, API is a reflection of that subsystem underneath. And underneath camera two is this entire rework of that camera subsystem, you know, all those layers, and what is known as the hardware abstraction layer. And basically because it is built on this kind of brand new kind of hardware, middleware uh, bit, it actually deprecates camera one. So if you're looking to do custom camera applications in the future, you're gonna have to get sit down and get comfortable with camera two. Uh, and it's gonna be hard, but you're gonna get a lot of benefits out of it. You know, you're gonna have much more substance control and lots and lots more features that you're able to implement with. Um, you're gonna have higher performance because there's a like, big focus um, on performance in camera two. And overall, in terms of for us as developers, the API is gonna be much more efficient and much more maintainable, which is, you know, sounds great. All right, so I, I think the thing that I wanna focus on most with talking to you guys is basically this hardware abstraction layer, you know, this subsystem, which basically uh, molds and forms the API on top of it. And I think by understanding what's going on, like the nuts and bolts there, you kind of understand why the API looks the way it looks. Uh, because if you just kind of sit down, you can't quite, quite understand what all these new terms are. And, and like the, even like the method names are just a lot more complex than it used to be. So we're going to talk about this kind of new frame-based request system. And we're going to talk about this new pipeline that has been introduced in the camera subsystem. And you know, all this stuff has basically resulted in an API that's completely new. It's a brand new package. And you're gonna get more, more, more. You're gonna get more functionality out of it. You're gonna get more metadata. And you're gonna get more verbosity. It takes a lot more work to do the same things in camera two the, than it took in camera one. But, you know, and that comes, that, that comes because of this efficiency and that kind of more flexibility. Um, and because what, what's going on is you're making kind of more low level requests. And, and again, you know, it's kind of more advanced, so we're using more advanced technology. You know, before camera one, the API calls are all in plain English, it's pretty straightforward to use. So you kind of have to get used to a new way of talking about the camera uh, on an Android device. So before we actually get started kind of digging into it, I kind of wanted to give you kind of the 10,000 foot view of all these layers. So I know that the diagram is really tiny, it's just a bunch of squares, but basically there are several layers that live between you in the Android framework and the camera device drivers. So there is the Android API, and between that is and between that and the camera is a native camera implementation. There's also a system service, which does kind of the job of like managing the camera assets on the on the device and kind of doling out you know control of it. And then finally, there's the hardware abstraction layer, and that's kind of like the last interface between the camera de the camera device drivers itself and everybody else. And the hell is something actually that is done on the manufacturer side. Now, if you're kind of interested in, you know, like JNI and IPC, uh, something interesting to note is that on the left side, left two columns is actually camera one, and on the right side is camera two. And you might notice if you were able to see the diagram that camera one actually uses JNI to communicate between um, the framework and the native camera limitation, whereas camera two uses like binder classes and IPC. Um, that's not going to be on the quiz at the end of the session. It's just I just thought it was interesting in case you're into that stuff. All right, so let's talk about this subsystem and, and this hardware abstraction layer, which I'm not gonna call how, because I don't have a lot of time. I don't wanna keep saying those words. Um, so before, with camera one, you know, we had the three operation modes, right? Preview, still, and video. So the new subsystem, the new how, has basically done away with all of that. You know, we're not talking at these high level, you know, kind of terms. We're gonna talk about single frame captures, right? Single, like, a single picture. 
And basically what we do from going from, from, going from camera one to camera two is basically translating those high level concepts of still video and preview into the idea of well, what kind of frame capture is that. So if you talk about a still capture uh, or still a picture, a picture, taking a picture, you're talking about a single frame capture. Now if you're talking about video, you know, that's that continuous stream of like image requests. So that becomes a repeating capture. And the same thing with preview. Now, because we're at this low level, uh, because we're talking about single frames, we can actually do those things like burst mode now. So a burst mode becomes, you know, X number of requests that the camera is going to execute for you as fast as it can. And in fact, you can take that kind of X set of camera requests and then do them repeatedly. So, you, you know, as you can see, we already have a kind of a lot more flexibility and a lot more ways of kind of voicing our requests to the camera. So another really cool thing that has come out of this new like single frame uh, request system is the idea of, well, of basically how you get that image data back. So, you know, camera one, you take a picture, you wait for those callbacks, and you get back a byte array of bitmap data, right? And then it's up to you to do something with it. You know, stick it in a surface view or put it in a file. You know, that's, it's kind of up to you to manage that data and do whatever you want with it. So something really cool with camera two is that in, this, in, in a very particular case of the camera two making things simpler, is that you can actually specify destinations for a frame request. And those destinations are basically any guy that has a surface in it for rendering data. And you can specify like one or more destinations for a single request. So instead of you taking that byte array and like doing things to it to get it to go where you want it to go, it will actually be kind of formatted and scaled and encoded for you and sent to your destinations. And this could include an image reader or the good old surface view and texture view if you want to put the picture in your view hierarchy. If you're working with video, you've got media recorder and media codec, or media recorder and media codec. And if you're doing render script, you can actually send image data right to the render script via an allocation. So as you can see, it's really, really cool. You know, you just, instead of you managing it, you'd be like, hey, just send it off to these guys and they'll take care of it for me. So big advantage of the new, uh, the new system. So another kind of interesting thing and something that kind of, I, I, I think, um, really kind of has molded the API is this pipeline. So taking a picture is not, you know, a simple process. There's a lot of steps, right? And, you know, HAL 3, camera 2, is really focused on performance. So what has happened now is that camera, that um, image taking process has been pipelined. So all these steps that can occur when you're capturing an image are basically, you know, um, broken down. And by pipelining this process, it actually increases the throughput. You know, the number of images that, image capture requests that you can process uh, for a certain amount of time is increased because you can actually have multiple capture requests in flight at the same time. They're just each at different stages. Now, there's actually another way that this increases performance of the camera, and it's more of a manufacturer thing. So if you look at all these different pieces here on this um, chart, so you have like the three A algorithms, which is like autofocus, auto exposure, and auto white balance. You have like scaling and cropping and coding for your different destinations, and you have like actually onboard image processing that happens, like noise reduction and color correction, all that stuff that happens like um, within the camera pipeline itself. Each of these pieces can actually be swapped out or rearranged or just customized by the manufacturer to fit a particular piece of hardware. So it's really cool because the manufacturer can basically take whatever components are, are best fit for that hardware and again, improving the performance, improving the efficiency of, you know, for that uh, piece of hardware. So again, you know, kind of a lot of ways of tackling this problem or this, this idea of getting more efficiency out of the camera. And you know, as a developer, well, that's great. General, good. It's more performance. What do I care? Actually, though, what is cool for us as developers is that now that this pipeline is exposed, you can actually kind of start sticking your fingers in there and kind of like messing with stuff and kind of playing with the post processing and how the 3A algorithms get triggered. So, while it's kind of good and a nice high level ooh, performance, yay, it also means kind of more stuff for you to do. Okay, so another big thing about the camera two API and subsystem is metadata. So there's a lot more data about the camera itself, like you get lens info now, you get sensor info, and there's a lot more data that kind of comes back when you make a request. So, you know, when you send in a request, you'll have some configuration, some settings that you have. And when you get the result um, for that request back, you'll get back the image data, but you'll also get back some other metadata that encapsulates not just like kind of like all the settings that kind of were in, in, a, in effect when the camera, when the image was taken, but also your original request. And then kind of the usual statistics, timestamps, all that stuff too. So why does that matter? Uh, metadata is great and all, but why, why, what does that do for us? 
Well, there's actually a lot of advanced features that um, require a lot more information than was previously available. So if you think about like HDR, right, high dynamic range, um, this whole process of trying to take multiple photos and squishing them together into an even better photo, that whole process is based on something called exposure bracketing, which is basically taking that same photo at different exposure intervals. Now, that process requires really accurate feedback on what, you know, what the exposure that you asked for was and what exposure you got back in order for you to properly you know, take, take the uh, composite or composite the photos together. So again, that's where, again, the metadata is pretty important. Now, the you know, always desired raw support is actually you know, really reliant on metadata itself. So you have to have the correct information about the sensor for you know, whatever you know, entity is writing that raw file format to be able to interpret the actual um, data, raw data that comes back from the sensor itself. So you need information about the sensor and its CFA and all this other kind of stuff that I don't quite understand. But again, metadata is really important to some of those advanced features and that's why it's such a prevalent part of this new API and subsystem. All right, so this is kind of like a not great diagram, but it kind of gives you a general summary of what kind of we just gone over in the fact that, you know, the way that the requests look now is that you do per frame requests. And kind of the cool thing is that before in camera one, where we kind of just set settings on the camera and then hope they applied when the picture got taken, you actually do settings per frame. So it applies to that particular request. And again, you know, you can specify multiple destinations, multiple target surfaces for each request goes through and you can have multiple requests in flight in the pipeline and when it comes out it goes the image that goes directly to your surfaces and again that metadata that comes back will have both the settings that you asked for and the settings that you actually got and then the kind of usual you know um, status and, and statistics okay so now that we've kind of gone over like the bones of what's going on in the api let's talk about just in a general level how you would actually work with camera 2 api so I generally like to start out talking about camera application building with what I like to call the Stone's Principle. And the Stone's Principle is this. You can't always get what you want, but if you try sometimes, you might find you get what you need. Sorry, horrible thing. So what the heck does this do with, has to do with application development? Well, I'll tell you. So Android developers, we're always used to like trying to figure out what our minimum SDK is, right? Like what features do I want my users to have? What features can I live without? And this takes on a, a lot, a, a third facet when you're talking about hardware, right? Because what API your user is using is one thing, and then what features are actually on that hardware is another thing. So you could have two phones, both running around like Lollipop, so they both have camera two. One has the craptastic camera, and one has the sexy new fully decked out camera. And so basically, even though they're both running the same API, they have completely different you know, feature sets. So again, it's really important when you're doing a camera application to figure out what your critical features are and separate them out from your optional features. And of course, there are like platform tools that allow you to do that. So you know we're all used to doing Google Play filtering with a manifest, and it's really important to use that users features tag in your manifest to figure out well I need a front camera, I need a focus, and I need autofocus and or not, and then you know using that to kind of basically filter out your user base um, from the top. Now if you have some optional features that you know you don't really care, like you are that would be good to have, but are not critical. There's a lot of runtime tools that you can use. So we've all used, you know, built the build out version number and check what it was, and either changed or hidden part of the UI based on what that number is. There's also the package manager, which you can query for, you know, what different hardware features your camera has, and the features that you kind of query the package manager for correspond very directly to the use features tag. So it's kind of like just more like the runtime version of the use feature tag features. So there's also a bit of querying you can do from the API th themselves. So in camera one, we had camera parameters, which told us you know, not just what features you had, but kind of what valid values you had to set on those features. And we have something similar in camera two, and that's camera characteristics. So again, you know, being able to separate out what you need from what you want and using the right tools to figure out what and when. So, you know, something that has come out of camera two is this idea of supported hardware level. Since we have just so many more features and functionality, um, you know, not every phone is going to have those. You know, because the support is, is very tightly tied to manufacturers, there's this new kind of concept of supported hardware level. So there's three levels. Um, the first one is full, and it basically guarantees you to have a certain set of features and meet certain performance requirements. So um, if you have a full device, it will definitely have like manual post-processing, you know, all that kind of onboard stuff. 
it will have like certain features and it will have meet certain requirements like a certain latency when you know when you change settings and when they actually kind of take effect in the camera that kind of thing um, limited is similar to full but basically it says well you might have some of those things you might not but limited also means that you are in fact on uh, both camera 2 the API and as well as the new kind of hardware subsystem layer so the third uh, hardware level is legacy and legacy basically lets you know that you are not guaranteed to have any of that fun stuff and Basically legacy when you have a device running legacy It basically means that you have camera 2, but it's more like a wrapper around the old camera 1 uh, API so you have relaxed performance constraints and none of that fun stuff So if you want kind of more a, a more detailed explanation and a more articulate one of what all those specific things are You can check out the documentation on that. Oh and um the last time I checked, the only devices that had full support were the Nexus 5 and Nexus 6. And I think there's like the HTC M something something um, had limited support. So if anybody knows of any other devices that are full, please tell me. I would love to know. Um, I assume the new Nexi will hopefully have full. But Okay, so a couple more things about the manifest. Um, if you've done camera one before, which a lot of you have, you know that you have to ask permission for the camera. Um, caveat is, is that if you just ask permission for the camera, you're basically requiring your users to have a back camera, a front camera, autofocus, and flash. So generally documentation highly recommends that you mark, you use the user's feature tag and mark some of these, you know, um, features as optional, just so you don't uh, inadvertently filter out more of your user base than you, need to, than you need to. So a couple other interesting things in Manifest, there isn't any tag if you don't care whether, it, whether it's a front or back camera. You can actually um, specify external cameras that your user device should support external cameras and there's a couple fun things that came from Olipop like the manual sexy stuff and um, the support hardware level. Okay so I'm not going to go over any code with you today just because um, it, you'd be here forever and you'd get mad at me but there are two really good examples on Google samples the Google samples github repo and that's camera 2 basic and camera 2 raw. Camera 2 basic is a really good starting point with all the basic stuff you know finding the cameras on the device, opening them, um, looking at the information on them, starting a preview, taking a picture. Um, camera 2 raw is very similar, but it adds, you know, um, it has an example of use doing raw files, uh, multiple output buffers, and how to handle like multiple requests coming into a queue. Uh, camera 2 basic is a good start, but I would really look at camera 2 raw if you're serious about doing camera 2 API, because camera 2 raw has some serious um, concurrency handling code in it, and that's really important with camera 2 API, as I will let you know why in a second. All right, so there's some new players in the team, uh, new classes, whole new package, whole new classes, and so we'll start off with the camera manager. So the camera manager is some service, gives you information and access to different cameras on your device, and it basically takes the place of some static methods that used to be on the old camera class. There's camera characteristics, which basically takes the place of the old camera info and camera parameters. And it's basically just how it sounds, you know, information about the camera, both the kind of physical aspects of the camera, the sensor, the lens, and its capabilities as well. And in place of the old camera object, you have a camera device. The camera device is, your, is a representation of a camera on the, on, you know, on the phone, device, whatever, and is also um, kind of like the handle to that resource and it's also your method of creating recapture requests and what is and it also creates what is a new concept of the new concept of the capture camera capture session now the camera capture session is actually a way of associating like an output surface with a camera device so i mentioned before that with this whole new frame based system you can actually specify multiple destinations for each request so the way that you handle that on the api side is with that camera capture session and that's how you can kind of pre-specify, pre you know, where, you know, different requests can go. And basically, even though you create requests through device, you send all of those requests to the camera capture session, okay? It's the gateway, and it's also who's going to be giving you callbacks when you get, like, different results back for your requests. All right, metadata. So there's some new metadata classes. So camera, meta camera metadata is a base class for the other two classes that we'll talk about, and it has a ton of key value pairs with different camera characteristics and kind of different settings when you're doing camera uh, camera capture that has a whole bunch of just different information um, and I would go check it out and so two, two, two child classes the camera request and the camera request because you're creating it off a camera device is tied directly to that device and it can only target surfaces that have been already set up and ready to uh, and are ready to use with that camera capture session that you started hopefully at some point there's the capture result 
And that, like I mentioned before, will contain not just information about that individual like capture, like the image data that you got back from that capture request, but also you know the original re request that you did, and you know hardware processing, all that kind of good stuff. Um, generally, the way that results work with Camera Two is that you'll get back more than one result. You'll get back kind of these in progress results, like these partial results, and then you'll finally get back a total capture result when the request process is, is fully completed. All right, so the basic steps taking um, or getting started with the camera. So first, get a list of connected camera IDs, pick out your favorite one, open that camera. Then you're going to set up any outputs that you want uh, those requests to go to, those services that you, know, you can send your request to, set those up. You're going to open a camera capture session to associate your open camera with your target outputs. And then once that's ready, you start cre creating requests setting them up, sending them through, and hopefully you'll get back image data and metadata. Um, you know, if you close a capture session, which you probably shouldn't do willy-nilly because camera capture sessions actually are pretty intensive to set up, you will have to go all the way back to step three. And if you switch cameras, you have to go all the way back to step two. So just things to keep in mind uh, when you're trying to switch resources. So this is a very involved diagram about everything I just talked about and what the whole flow of request to result looks like on the new camera system. Uh, please don't read this right now. But basically just this idea of kind of a summary of like just the different features that you have and the different method calls that you use. Um, the caveat is this is on the documentation right now, but it's a little old. Uh, some of the method names have changed, but the soul remains the same. So if you're interested in camera two, check this guy out and um, yeah. So again, don't read this whole slide. So one of the things about Camera 2 API, and I know there's like this whole rule that you shouldn't have a wall of text on a slide. This, there's a good reason for this. And I don't want you to read it because I want to, to show you that, you know, with all of this new functionality has come a lot more verbosity in the API. And so I have, you know, kind of some general tasks that you do when you're working with the camera on the left there in yellow. And the left column is Camera 1, right column is Camera 2. So as you can see, opening a camera and setting up a preview is not too bad, about the same amount of like method calls. And then you go down to start a preview. And if you look at camera one, there's like two method calls. Set preview display, basically, where's my preview going? Start preview. And then camera two side, there's like six or seven different things going on that you do manually yourself. So I mean, it's just not nearly as simple. You know, before camera one, plain English, start preview. Camera two, good luck. Um, so again, it's just kind of illustrating the point that with camera two, camera one, you kind of got things easy, you know, user-friendly, developer-friendly API. Now you actually you have to be very specific and know exactly what you need to set up, you know, a preview, and knowing that you need autofocus, and knowing that you need all these other things, and explicitly creating requests for that and starting them. So you might not be able to see it, but I kind of have these little star and crosses next to some of the API calls. So on camera one, a lot of the calls were just synchronous. You know, opening a camera is a synchronous process and things like that. So camera two, because it's focused more on performance, has kind of opened things up. And now with a lot of the camera API, camera two API method calls, you can actually pass a handler to a background thread. So you can do all this kind of intensive, excuse me, hard, hardware manipulation on a background thread. It's a good thing. You should do it. But it cr increases the complexity. It increases, you know, you having to manage and understand like what state uh, your different camera objects are in and handling all that and concurrency and all that good stuff. So basically, camera two is harder and more complex and more verbose to use. So, but if you actually want to get started, um, there's something that you know that I've always liked to call the surface dance. So actually, getting up and running with a camera is not like a linear process. There's a lot of things that kind of happen at different places, and you have to kind of get them to coordinate and dance together and twirl around. So usually, when you do a camera um, application, you have a preview, right, it's rendering somewhere. Now, that preview starts out with maybe a surface view or texture view somewhere in your view hierarchy. The surface that's actually rendering your preview doesn't just appear magically, OK? It has to be set up. So you actually have to listen for some callbacks that will let you know when that surface is created. So on the other side of things, when you're actually talking about the camera devices and getting access to those, you know, you actually now have to do an asynchronous call to open the camera. So, you know, now so now we've got surface on the side that we need to wait for to be created, and then we've got this camera here that we're waiting to be opened. And so, okay, let's say we've got our surface done. Well, you're not quite ready to use it yet because surfaces have to be very specific sizes in order to work uh, to be able to be used with the camera, um, as you might know from camera one. So 
Even after your surface is created, you have to go back to the camera, ask it what sizes it wants for previews, adjust the surface to fit that selected size, and then hope at some point the camera is opened. Is it open? Yay! So now that you have your camera open, your surface created and perfectly sized, then you can create a camera capture session to associate the two. And hopefully that create that um, starts up correctly, and then you can do requests, um, camera, camera requests. So, taking a picture. Camera one, autofocus. Wait for autofocus callback. Take picture. Wait for take picture callback. Done. Camera two. All that stuff on the right. So camera two, you know, um, when you're taking a picture, right? You know, we had autofocus, but there's other things like the three A auto exposure, uh, auto white balance. So before in camera one, all of that was taken care of in the black box. You didn't have to think about it. You basically had to turn it off and on. Now in camera two, um, and this is kind of going back to that camera pipeline where we could start sticking our fingers in. Now you actually have to trigger um, those different algorithms to run and wait for them to kind of finish doing what they're doing before proceeding to the next step or doing something else or you have to manage. There's all kinds of nice new things that you have to do personally uh, and manually. So for example, camera two, if we want to take a picture. First, we want to autofocus, like back in camera one. So you create a capture request and you basically specify that capture request to trigger the autofocus and then you send that request to the capture session and you wait. And you're gonna get back those like in progress results that I mentioned. And you have to basically check each one and check the autofocus state and be like, hey, is the autofocus locked? And if it says no, then okay. Then you wait for the next result to come in. And then you keep checking and checking until it is locked. And it's locked, so good. Next, if you wanna do auto exposure, you need to do what is called the auto exposure pre-capture. Now the pre-capture is this kind of sequence um, of commands in the camera that basically do metering, you know, reading the light levels and determining right, the right ISO and all that stuff, you know, given the ambient light levels. So you have to trigger that. And just like the autofocus, you have to kind of wait for those results and listen to them and say, hey, has the auto exposure converged? And you have to know that you're waiting for it to converge. I, I thought that was really amusing kind of terminology there. But yeah, so basically you keep listening for results. When the auto exposure has converged, then you know you're good to go. And you can continue on to actually do a still capture request. So you build your capture, you set all your settings, you know, set your tone and like flash on and all that kind of stuff. You send it into the camera capture session and you wait for the capture to complete. And if you get back image data, yay! But you are not done because you have to start that, that preview back up. And instead of just saying start preview again like we did in camera one, we gotta go through the whole rigmarole of create a capture request. Set the autofocus to this mat, send it through, and hopefully it'll start again. So as you can see, you have a lot more capability, you have a lot more flexibility, you have a lot more power in camera two than you had in camera one. You forsake the plain English method calls and you forsake the simplicity to get more power because you know the whole Uncle Ben thing, more power responsibility. So um, I guess the takeaway here is that if you are working with camera two, you have to actually study and understand the whole process more and you know, have to be up for doing it yourself. Okay, so just to kind of wrap things up, let's talk about some caveats when you're working with camera. So this is from camera one, so you guys probably know this, and that this is that you should not monopolize camera assets. If you pick up a camera, you should release it whenever you're done. And usually the kind of convention is to pick it up and on resume and to drop it in on pause. If you take a camera and never release it and your user goes to another camera cap application and starts it, you will crash that other app. So you should really be a good neighbor to your fellow camera apps and you know release camera uh, device when you're done. Uh, same thing with switching cameras. Please don't like start picking up all the cameras. If you're switching from front to back, just drop the one that you're not using. Um, another caveat, again, is what I like to call the surface dance, you know, this idea that, you know, setting up a camera is not a linear process, so make sure that, you know, surfaces are sized correctly and, you know, um, output images are sized correctly. This is a kind of a really big deal. Like, if you've worked with camera one, you know sometimes that if you don't set the parameters right, you might get an error, you might not, it might just fight, fail silently, so just something to be careful of. And something to note is that, um, you know, I'm kind of going back to the idea that the language of camera two is a lot more advanced. Um, the Before in camera one, if you wanted to get what the preview sizes were, you just said, hey, get preview sizes. Now you have to go to the scalar stream configuration map and pull out the right uh, key pair. And I had no idea what that was when I first like looked at the documentation. I was like, what is the scalar stream, stream configuration map? So again, um, research and getting acquainted with the language of camera two API is very important. All right. 
Camera two caveats about concurrency, and I apologize for the gratuitous alliteration. Um, so API, what, GNU API, subsystem, and HAL 3 is really form, uh, focused on performance. You know? There's a lot more things that are done asynchronously. There's a lot more chances for you to put work on the background thread, and you should do it. But that also means that you will have to kind of worry about concurrency. You know, you'll have callbacks that happen on the background thread, but then there have other ones that happen on the UI thread. So make sure that you are using concurrency correctly. You know, synchronizing your fields. Um, and kind of a big, big um, problem now is that because that opening of the camera is asynchronous, if you if your app gets closed in the middle of one of those calls, that poor camera like asset or camera resource you get orphaned, and now no one can use it, and everyone's crashing. So um, I had not seen a semaphore in like years until I saw like the camera two raw um, code. So you know, definitely keep that in mind that you you are going to have to manage these things yourself, um, and that is a trade off for the better performance. So, in general, um, if you want to do a custom camera application, um, don't just use an intent. No, but um, but really, like, again, um, camera two API. It's a really it's really quite brilliant. It's a great system. A lot more flexible um, from a high level better API, more efficient, more maintainable, a lot more work for you. But there is a lot of good stuff in there if you're willing to put in the time and the effort. Um, and that's it. Um, thank you guys for coming. I actually do have like five minutes left for questions. Or is it five minutes? Yeah, so I have five minutes left for questions. If anyone has a question? Sure. Is it easier to test the camera too? Yeah, you can have a lot of stuff. Automated tests, unit tests, instrumentation tests, and then you uh, sorry, so the question was, is it any easier to test in camera two versus camera one? There aren't any like explicit mechanisms for testing. I mean, I'd say about as hard as camera one. That, there's, not, there's not any like mechanisms that make it easier. And it might even be harder just because of the asynchronicity and like the whole thread, like, you know, manually doing all that kind of like backgrounding. So um, I guess no, <laughs> that's my answer. Yes? So given that most phones are just implementing a legacy uh, camera two API, um, that's a really good question. So, sorry, the question was whether you should, since a lot of devices don't support camera two now, um, whether it's a good time just to get in there and get ahead of the field. Is that kind of the question? Yeah. So, in my personal opinion. So, um, in my opinion, you know, since I mean, since there are two devices that have full. And if you are really interested in doing advanced photographic applications, I'd say run with it. Um, and you know, it's it's kind of a tough thing because the support for this is so manufacturer dependent. You know, we're at their mercy as per usual. Um, so I guess it's kind of up to you. Um, you know, how much, except how acceptable is it for your app to only run perfectly on Nexus Five, Nexus Six versus anything else? So I mean, I think it's cool. There's actually in Marshmallow, I just looked at the API. There's a lot kind of new stuff going on. So I, it looks like now you can actually feed an image back into the camera to do, to utilize that camera pro, uh, post-processing. You can actually feed an image back into the camera uh, API, it looks like, to be able to kind of do your own extra processing on top of that. And there's a lot of kind of cool video stuff which I don't understand very well. But so, I mean, I it is the future of camera, so I would say if you're really serious about it, just go for it. So, uh, any other questions? Cool, thank you guys so much for coming and uh, have a great DroidCon.